Good evening. My name is Ed McCartan, and I've been in the financial services industry for my entire career. I started on the floor of the Chicago Board Options Exchange when it had just opened as an independent floor trader and before moving on to the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. I spent about 10 years in that business as an independent trader before moving on and joining several different major financial companies, Solomon Brothers, J.P. Morgan, and Robertson Stevens, a boutique investment bank on the West Coast that was owned by a major regional bank in the Northeast. During my profession, I focused on trading equities and on derivatives, including options, futures, and over-the-counter swaps. What I'd like to talk about this evening is how we, the big banks have learned how to privatize profits and socialize their risks, and the way that even now you continue to pay for the collapse of 2008 as a taxpayer, and in a way in which the Federal Reserve has subsidized the very entities which let us down so badly. In the collapse that we saw in 2008, as the crisis began to unfold in the United States, we could see at first that Bear Stearns was in a lot of trouble, that people were hearing the rumors, they were starting to flee, hedge funds were pulling their money out, they didn't want to have securities or cash in possession of, of Bear Stearns. Bear Stearns could not get short-term financing, and overnight money is the lifeblood of the way this business works. There is an enormous amount of money that finances both banks and investment banks on a day-to-day-to-day -to -day -to -day basis. It's criti critical to their viability. If you cannot get overnight funding, you're not going to be around very long. In fact, Bear Stearns uh, was forced into the arms of J.P. Morgan, which took them over, took over the accounts, took over the property, and all the other remaining assets and liabilities of Bear Stearns. Lehman Brothers was the next to go. But when Lehman simply was driven out of business as opposed to taken into the arms of a stronger institution, it set off a global panic. And overnight, we saw dramatic declines in the market for bonds and common stocks all around the world because the view was, well, suddenly these institutions aren't too big to fail. And it was a crisis in confidence that was so disruptive that the regulators at Treasury and the Federal Reserve Board and the Department of, um, of the Treasury realized that they had to take a very different approach. So in essence, those first two collapses were effectively born by the shareholders and the bondholders of those two companies. And in the capitalist system, that's where risk generally resides. If you invest in these companies, or if you invest, whether it be their shares or their bonds, you bear the risk that those investments would go to zero. But, and I think rightly, the Fed and the Treasury said, well, if we let that happen to a couple of commercial banks, we have the 1930s all over again. We're going to have a full-blown systemic banking crisis, and what we've got as a recession might very well be the next Great Depression. But I have to say that the policy response has been to effectively take interest rates to zero, and for a very long time. This is the new Fed policy, and it is an attempt to prop up these banks and restore them to profitability through a variety of mechanisms which we'll discuss. The alternative would have been to say to the banks, no, if you've had losses in these markets, you have to recapitalize. You have to go out and sell more bonds, you have to go out and sell more shares, and that, of course, runs the risk of diluting the interests of the bondholders, diluting the interests of the shareholders, which is sort of punitive on the owners of those enterprises. Instead of making them take the pain, that mantelpiece was assumed by all of us via the Fed.
These show borrowings from the Federal Reserve by the commercial banks. You'll notice that for the lifetime of this time series, that number is very, very close to zero for a good reason. The Fed has always backstopped the banks. It's always said, look, if you get into a crunch and you need funding, you can come to us through the so-called discount window. But because they're the lender of last resort, the assumption was if you did borrow from the discount window, you were in a lot of trouble. And you were very much marked as a pariah because you couldn't get funding from the interbank market. You had to go to the last lender out there. Consequently, because of reputation risk, banks don't want to go anywhere near the Fed to borrow. And that's why the line is a flat line. Until that spike in September of 2008, which persists to this day, the Fed basically went to the banks and said, it's no longer considered to be a mark of shame to come to us. If you need money, come to us. The last thing that we want is another banking crisis where your depositors are lined up in the street eager to pull their money, every last cent of it, out of the bank. That's what caused the systemic bank failure in 1932. They didn't want a repeat of that. Just think of the visuals of poor people and women standing with their babies waiting to get their life savings out of these banks. A horrible picture indeed. The Fed said, we can't let that happen under any circumstances. So they rode to the rescue. At that inflection point is September of 2009, when things were really, really getting out of hand. The markets weren't stabilizing, they were getting worse. And the Fed, being quite concerned about that, said, we need to pump reserves into the system. And they did it in a really, really dramatic way. As you can see, prior to the crisis, the, um, the overall adjusted monetary base rises a little bit, but not very much. And then suddenly, the, the Fed floods money into the banking system. And up we go. That goes all the way through 2010 and uh, going, coming into this year. And then, lo and behold, again, it happens. The public pronouncements of the Fed are, you know, things are stabilized. We're coming back. Things are going to get better. Then why do we have another one of these injections. As a trader, I look at this and say, this doesn't conform to what I'm being told. If they're actually pumping money into the system, it's for a reason that they see and that I don't. And frankly, it worries me. The zero interest rate policy basically consists of mandating that the rate at which you can borrow from the Fed is now at a policy level of zero. And it's been there since 2008. As you can see in this graph, the areas in gray are periods of recession. And of course, the federal fund rate drops during those periods of recession every single time. And then once the economy stabilizes and begins to recover, the Fed can slowly increase interest rates to more normal levels. But we've had in 2001, the dot-com collapse and the ensuing correction, the attacks on New York and Washington, huge stock market crashes, and then again, a repeat in 2008. The Fed's response on both occasions was, let's dramatically lower interest rates to stabilize and get the economy going again. So what did the banks do with it? This is a chart of the holdings of United States government securities, T-bills, T-notes, T-bonds, at all commercial banks. And what you can see is that every time the banks are prepared to lend the money, every time the, the Fed is prepared to lend banks money at zero interest rates, they buy treasuries. This is a riskless transaction. I borrow money at zero, I lend it back to the treasury, 10-year notes trade at 230, 2.3% risklessly. I make that investment, sit back, and collect the interest payments. This doesn't require risk-taking. This doesn't require a great deal of, of thought. 
This is a way to effectively make the banks profitable and to build up their capital base instead of making their shareholders do it or their bondholders do it. So this is an implicit subsidy by financing these companies at zero and letting them reinvest. They're making money. They're minting money. To give you an idea of the magnitude of what this, this trade means, in just the first six months of this year, the net interest margin, which is fancy words for the cost of my funds versus the yield on my investments, has grossed $211 billion to these banks with a net profit of $58 billion, or about nearly $10 billion per month, risk-free. Wouldn't you like to be able to do that for your own account? But at the very same time, because this money is being tied up in the government securities market, look what's happened to the willingness of banks to lend or lease for mortgages, for commercial loans, for student loans or car loans. This is the year-over-year -year change in the rate of lending. And as you can see, it's plummeted. It's actually contracting. Just as generals prepare to fight the last war, and they're concerned about the risks of that war, the big banks are, are concerned about the very things that burn them, i.e., mortgages. If you think it's difficult to get a mortgage now, it's because the losses from mortgages in the 2008 crisis totaled up to $2.1 trillion. It takes a lot of years of that arbitrage, that trade that I showed you before, to make that $2 trillion back. And what do you do? You don't lend to us. You don't lend to corporations. You lend the money to the government by buying government paper. Here's another interesting statistic. Banks are required to, re to hold reserves. When you put your money in the bank, they lend most of it out because that's what they do to make a living, but they are required to maintain reserves in the event that they had a sudden inrush of depositors who wanted to take their funds out. They can't run their cash chills down to zero or we'd have a banking crisis. But you never want to have more than the minimum. That doesn't make any sense. You're leaving cash sitting idle in the drawer when it could be invested, it could be lent. So in most ordinary circumstances, banks do not keep excess reserves. They keep the minimum. But suddenly, when the crisis comes, they're all afraid of being tarred as the, the next weak financial institution. They want to show strength. They want to show excess reserves. So they start hoarding cash. The Federal Reserve Board steps in and says, well, we want you to have a very strong appearance to the public as well. So <clears throat> we will actually pay you to keep those reserves on your books, something that has not been done before. The Fed doesn't pay interest. Now they do. They now pay one quarter of 1% on excess reserves. This graph is a little bit outdated in that the current excess reserve number is $1.6 trillion. So even that quarter of 1%, as small as it may sound to you, is more than you could get if you bought a two-year or perhaps even a three-year note and it's a subsidy, a direct subsidy, of $4 billion to the holders of these excess reserves paid for by you via the United States Treasury. I just did a back of the envelope calculation this afternoon and realized that that is an implicit tax of $13.33 for every man, woman, and child in the United States. You didn't know you were paying it, but you are in addition to the impact of the collapse in housing prices, the ensuing unemployment, all the, measure, all the variables that are a little bit too difficult to measure when you're performing an analysis. So I have a question here about this. 
why didn't they just regulate that the banks had to keep more reserves? They're using the so-called free market, um, paying the banks to keep reserves rather than requiring them. They could do so, and they could re they could re reverse this ability to be able to pay on reserves. There's nothing that says that they have to do it. They're doing it to make sure that the public feels that the banks are highly solvent and that they have liquidity in the event that they need to. But it's fundamentally because the Fed doesn't like employing regulation. Again, a little bit more of the view of laissez-faire. Let the markets function and we will um, will let them restore themselves to profitability. In fact, the Fed is not forcing the banks to restore their capitalization. They're permitting them to do so by their generous application of the discount window, allowing these companies to borrow. And in my opinion, it simply led to less commercial lending and less consumer lending. And it's prolonging the economic contraction that we're going through. If you have the opportunity to be paid to hoard cash, why would you lend?